It's time for the Longine Chronoscope, a television journal of the important issues of the hour, brought to you every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. A presentation of the Longine Whitnor Watch Company, maker of Longine, the world's most honored watch, and Whitnor, distinguished companion to the world honored Longine. Good evening, this is Frank Knight. May I introduce our co-editors for this edition of the Longines Chronoscope? Edward P. Morgan and Bill Costello, both from the CBS television news staff. Our distinguished guest for this evening is the Honorable Clayton Fritchie, Deputy Chairman of the Democratic National Committee. Mr. Fritchie, with a prominent and important politician in our midst, it would be most appropriate for us to discuss politics on Chronoscope tonight, and that we propose to do. But beforehand, it occurs to me that often a lot of us take a great deal for granted. And uh, we say that we know uh, uh, what a chairman or a deputy chairman of a political party is and does, but we really would be hard put for a definition. What do the chairman and the deputy chairman of a party, specifically the Democratic Party, do? Well, confusion in that uh, area is understandable. Uh, Committees change from time to time, and their roles change, particularly when a party that has been in power goes out of power. When you're in power, your committee is engaged largely with organizational matters, patronage to some extent, contact in the field, and uh, many affairs of that nature. Uh, when you're in power, the party as a whole looks to the White House for leadership. It looks to the executive departments for information, for research, for ideas for the whole stream of intelligence, so to speak, that activates the party and keeps it nourished. Now, when you go out of power, you lose uh, your personnel in these executive departments. Therefore, one of the first acts after the last election was for Chairman Mitchell, with the approval of Mr. Stevenson and Mr. Truman, to reorganize the Democratic National Committee and created two deputy chairmanships under him. One for uh, matters of the field, organization, and fundraising, and secondly, a public affairs division under my direction. And that includes publicity, public relations, radio, TV, matters with which uh, you are uh, uh, familiar and interested, um, liaison committees with the House, with the Senate, the library, and particularly a new and highly developed research division to supply information and intelligence to our own party. Does that give you That's a, a quick very slant? scholarly and lucid answer, I would say. But uh, it brings us uh, to another point that you have mentioned by uh, indirection, at least, and that is your new duties as editor of a publication which I believe is called the Democratic Digest. Bill Costello and I would be most happy to put some questions to you about that. Shall I hold this before the camera so our uh, readers well, can see it? <laughs> Get a good plug in for it? That's up well, to you. Tell us how uh, it originated, yes. Mr. Fritchie. Well, it flows from exactly the same um, uh, problem that I mentioned earlier, the problem of intelligence. Uh, as you know, we Democrats, whether we are right or wrong, have felt that in, at least insofar as the editorial pages of the country are concerned, we have not had uh, a favorable press. Uh, by that, we don't mean to suggest or to insinuate that we have been mistreated in the news columns or the news columns have been distorted or biased. But we do think that the editorial pages of the country have been predominantly Republican and that some 80 to 90 percent of the American newspapers, the large dailies, have supported Republican candidates in recent elections. Now, well, what do you pro propose to prove with well, this Well, I want to add this one thought, Ed. Uh, during the last 20 years, that was offset to some extent by the fact that the Democrats were in power and that the president was a Democrat and his voice could always be heard. And every paper carries the president's remarks on page one automatically. Now, uh, one reason that we were uh, greatly concerned after the election, insofar as intelligence is concerned, is that we not only had a press that was predominant Republican, in its policy at least, but also the Republicans now had the voice in the White House. And that was really the genesis of this magazine, which we hope will become a real instrument in giving more adequate expression to the Democratic point of view. Well, does that mean that you expect the magazine to become the spokesman for the party for lack of a, of a presidential spokesman? Well, let me say this, and I think this is true probably of the Republican Party as well as the Democratic one. I think even Mr. Eisenhower agreed there's no one voice in either party. 
Um, this is not the voice of the Democratic Party because there is no such thing. There are many voices in the Democratic Party, some greater than others, some uh, uh, claiming more attention than others. But there are a number, and this attempts to reflect the voices of the Democratic Party. May I put it that way? Can we aim one right between the eyes and ask you who's running the Democratic Party now? I think they'll be very difficult to ask about either party. They are run by a great many men uh, from a great many sections of the country, all of whom contribute a great deal in different ways to the total intelligence and leadership and policies of the parties. Mm -hmm. Well, now, in, in the uh, establishment of this magazine... I, I mean that in an entirely and sincere way, and I think you notice from the last six months that even the President of the United States has difficulty always in speaking exclusively for his own party. Now, in getting the digest underway, Mr. Fritchie, uh, what sort of circulation results have you had so far? And particularly, what results have you had down south in the, uh, in the deep south states, which, uh, some of which voted Republican in the last election? We find um, the response uh, more or less uniform. Can't find any regional distinctions. Uh, as you know, uh, it's, it's never very attractive to boast uh, about um, one's activities. But I think you know, as a matter of record now, that we had a truly phenomenal sale of the first two issues. The third issue will be out around September the 11th. We hope this will not be a flash in the pan. No doubt some of this was curiosity sales, some of it novelty. Uh, but the press has been uh, extremely kind and flattering and helpful. Um, and commentators, uh, radio and TV alike. Magazines attracted many editorials. I must warn you mm -hmm. that uh, we're going to have a uh, distinguished Republican on Chronoscope soon. Uh, one of the first ones, I believe, is going to be uh, the former chairman of the uh, Republican National Committee, Mr. Hugh Scott, the congressman from from uh, Pennsylvania, and uh, we intend to quiz. Author, Ed. Uh, so, so I understand. Uh, we're going to quiz him about uh, their editorial aspirations and uh, what criticisms, uh, if any, they have on. Uh, on the Democratic Digest, but let's Did move into the broadest... Did you notice that magazine article of Mr. Scott's about the Republic Republican Party? It's I haven't read exactly it. It's exactly the as same yet. as the leading article on this issue of the Democratic Digest, which is titled, How the Democrats Saved Eisenhower from His Own Party. He scooped us. <laughs> well, we'll ask him about that. All right. Let's move into the broader area of, of politics. Um, the president, I believe, is going to make a rather extensive trip in September and October from uh, the East Coast clear down into Texas. Does that indicate that... Which president are you referring to? The president of the United no. States. Uh, have we got more than one? one? No. We still refer uh, naturally in a sentimental way, Truman is... Oh. That's just no, I'm right. referring to the president of the United States. Because they're both going to be on the road in September. Uh, he's, he's making this trip, uh, obviously, to... Uh, in his capacity as president, and I'm wondering if he's getting the jump on the uh, Democrats uh, apropos of the 1954 elections. Oh, I don't think that's the president's intention. Uh, I think uh, he apparently enjoys getting around the country and seeing people and finding out what's going on. Probably a very worthwhile thing for a president to do. And um, uh, his speeches may be entirely political, but uh, we don't know that to be a fact. Uh, I think people like to see their president like to hear from him. What about uh, Governor Stevenson now? Uh, he's going to make an appearance in Chicago in mid-September. What other plans does he have after that for public appearances? Now, Bill, they're, they're somewhat fluid. As you know, he just got back to this country about a week ago, and he's been a, through a grueling trip of six months. And I think he's look, longing right now just to get some cool air and get in the woods for a little bit. Uh, we hope that he will give some further time uh, to party affairs uh, during the remainder of the fall, as you know, he's going to make a speech in September, September the 15th in Chicago. That's going to be under um, uh, nonpartisan auspices and will not be a particularly a, a political speech. It will be held in connection, however, with a party rally in Chicago on September 14th and 15th. And there will be a party dinner on Monday the 14th at which he will appear along with former President Truman and uh, numerous other uh, leaders of the party. Partly in connection with this uh, clam bake, and no offense meant because we usually refer to such things as clam bakes, uh, there's been a good deal said, speculated, that there is uh, something of a rift remaining within the Democratic Party, particularly between the Southern Democrats 
And the Northern Democrats and Senator Holland of Florida made a point of refusing an invitation that you gave him to the Chicago conference. What about that? I saw that, Ed. Oh, I think um, a political party, a large political party, is pretty much like a large family. There are always some differences of opinion, uh, some difficulties, not total meeting of the minds at all times, but by and large, when the pinch comes, the party pretty well stands together. Uh, I think, as you know yourself, there has been a great effort this year uh, uh, to play down the differences in the party and to achieve a reconciliation uh, as much as possible. I think Chairman Mitchell has done extraordinarily well in that respect, and I'm sure a number of senators, uh, Southern senators would agree that he well, has. That may be true. Final, yeah. A final question now. No. Um, the Republicans have been in seven months. Uh, I'll ask you to answer this quickly. What is your assessment of the situation up to now? Uh, hypothetically, who would win an election tomorrow? Well, I'm a very poor authority since I thought Stevenson was going to win the last election. Um, I think we're in, uh, to answer quite seriously and as objectively as possible, I think we are in, in an interim stage where policies have not coalesced, where they're not frozen. We don't know exactly yet what the foreign policy is going to be. We don't know whether the administration is going to come up with the sales tax in January. We don't know what they're going to do about the farm problem. As you know, that's quite serious. In other words, things are in a state of flux. Quite. Thank yeah. you very much. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much, Mr. Yeah. Fritchie. The opinions that you've heard our speakers express tonight have been entirely their own. The editorial board for this edition of the Longines Chronoscope was Edward P. Morgan and Bill Costello, both of the CBS television news staff. Our distinguished guest was the Honorable Clayton Fritchie, Deputy Chairman of the Democratic National Committee. Do you know that a long gene watch actually improves with use? That given proper care, a long gene watch after five or even after ten years of service is actually a better watch than it was the day you bought it. Yes, long years after an inferior watch is virtually worn out, a long gene watch continues to be an accurate and a dependable timepiece. So may I suggest that when you're planning the purchase of a very fine watch, compare the facts about Longines with the facts you have about other watches you know. The facts reveal Longines as one of the very finest of watches. In side-by-side -side comparison with the best watches of the world, Longines is the only watch to win 10 World's Fair Grand Prizes, 28 gold medals, and highest honors for accuracy, a position of preference in sports aviation and in science. The Longines watch of today is endowed with those qualities of greater accuracy and long life for which Longines watches are world renowned. And yet you may buy and own or proudly give a Longines watch for as little as 7150. Longines, the world's most honored watch, the world's most honored gift, premier product of the Longines Whitnor Watch Company since 1866 maker of watches of the highest character. We invite you to join us every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday evening at this same time for the Longines Chronoscope, the television journal of the important issues of the hour, broadcast on behalf of Longines, the world's most honored watch, and Whitnor, distinguished companion to the world honored Longines. This is Frank Knight. Reminding you that Longines and Whitnor watches are sold and serviced from coast to coast by more than 4,000 leading jewelers who proudly display this emblem, Agency for Longines Whitnor Watches. Tuesday night, there's suspense on the CBS television network.